Welcome to Horace's community. Today we'll be discussing the importance of trustworthy and responsible leadership in a world where we see less of it. The United States and many other nations have noted reduced trust in the ability of political leaders to address the challenges crucial to our daily lives and our future. Cynicism about political leaders is running high, particularly when new pressures arising from globalization are making the involvement of government more important than ever. How do we install trustworthy and responsible leaders with the inspiration and power to solve the issues that our nations need to solve? Before we hear our panelists' individual expert perspectives, I would like to share a few thoughts. I think it is important to reflect upon our individual and collective evolutionary journey, starting with our immediate family, growing with our friends and acquaintances within our communities, countries, and continents. These environments shape our behavior and form our values by installing reactivity or nourishing proactivity in our attitudes, aptitudes, and approach. Intentions are not enough. Reflective and conscious leadership, engagement, and genuine interactions are fundamental to the growth of an environment where respectful, trustworthy leadership may thrive. As such, our panel today brings together individuals who have been nourished and growing in different environments, yet have emerged onto the same platform today to reflect on these important issues. So how do we get to this position, a situation where finger pointing, blame, and aggression are norm of cultural, social, political discourse? No doubt we have many issues to face in the coming decade, sustainable development, climate, inequality, and health are just a few. We are all born to our mothers, nourished or let down by our respective environments. However, to grow to our full potential is our prerogative. This panel hopes to instill some hope in the endeavor that the shed light on some of the personal and professional obstacles our panelists have come across in their perspective journeys. As I introduce each panelist, I would like to invite them to share and expand their personal experience, visions of leadership within the transforming world of families, business, politics, and communities locally and internationally. Our first speaker is Gary Shapiro. Gary is based in Washington and joins us from Aspen at the early hour. Thank you for joining for Gary. He is president of CEO, president and CEO of the Consumer Technology Association, which represents more than 2,200 consumer technology companies. Gary is also a New York Times bestselling published author, having written a series of books on innovative leadership within the ever-changing dynamics of our world. Through these books, television appearances, and as a col columnist with over 1,000 opinion pieces, Gary has helped direct policy makers and business leaders on the importance of innovative leadership in the U.S. economy. Gary, the stage is yours. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for having me. And it's a real honor to be here to talk about something that's so important, and that is trust. It seems to me that this past year has focused on trust in a totally different way because we have dealt with each other electronically more than physically. And the other than our own pod or cocoon of people that we, we trust that will stay with us and not spread the, this horrible pandemic disease, we've been dealing with our uh, partners, our employees, our colleagues, surely through one means, and that is a two-dimensional screen uh, where our image and our sound, our voice can be heard. And it is good to communicate and important that we maintain that. But one thing that in my discussions with CEOs across North America has revealed is that there's almost a unanimous view that it has been a challenge to deal 
with the various um, stakeholders, the employees, the partners, the customers, simply through this one media. And that the five sense experience of being face to face and being able to evaluate someone's body language and look into their eyes and spend some time or share a meal or share a laugh has been evaporated for the last year. And that's something which uh, I think we all long to get back to um, and get back to some sense of norm normalcy where we can build on trust because trust is, is something which is a relationship. It is a series of, um, of interactions. It's built around our culture. And one of the challenges, for example, I've seen even in my own organization is onboarding new employees and new people is especially a, a challenge in this time uh, of uh, building, uh, of, of dealing with each other in a sense uh, from many different areas around the country, if not the world. And that's something that uh, we have to work on. Even this conference, which is such a phenomenal reputation where, we, where people meet uh, and get to know each other, it's, it's, it's being held differently. And the joy of serendipity, of discovery of new people, we could do it by hearing them speak, perhaps, or meeting them in a chat room. But that random encounter in a city where we all converge uh, has gone away. And that's something, as someone, my organization, for those of you that don't know, runs the largest, <laughs> if you will, face-to-face -face business meeting in the world. It's the CES held every January, except this past one in Las Vegas. And it attracts about 150 to 175,000 people every year uh, that are built around one thing. And that's the focus is on innovation and what is being discovered um, that will make a difference in the world. And how do we get the various uh, segments of the marketplace together? And one of the things that, that, that I have focused on and our organization's mission is focused on is in innovation. I've written three books on innovation and over a thousand articles. And one of the things that's changed dramatically in the last just 10 to 20 years is that innovation uh, relies most heavily upon um, different, going outside your own comfort zone or your vertical area of expertise and dealing with someone with their vertical area of expertise. And if you think about that, in, even in industries, the vertical industry segments where you are uh, going out to another vertical industry segment, whether it's the automobile, the music industry, or the, or the uh, technology world, or the any of these different worlds coming together, broadcast content creators, uh, health technology, and they're coming together and using technology in a way um, to create new things which better serve the world, better serve their customers, and fill needs which are, be are not being met. We're especially seeing that in healthcare and technology, which has been even happily fostered by, in a sense, the silver lining of this pandemic is our ra rapid shift to digital innovation. I have advocated for many, many years now two uh, very short statements. One is that every company is a tech company, and that has certainly been proven in the last couple of years. And another statement is innovate or die. And the innovate or die refers to the fact that unless you change, the world will change around you. and You have to, to grow. You have to meet. You have to do different things. So I used to wonder why people got MBA degrees, and I, I don't have one, um, but I've learned in the last few years at an MBA, a master's of business administration. The degree is very valuable in the sense that it allows people to develop relationships, focus as a team, learn cross-cultural, cross-language skills, learn the basics, and establish those vertical, um, get out of your own vertical expertise and shift to someone else and learn what they're doing so you can do something better and build something bigger together. And that requires not only a willingness to entertain something different outside your area, but also the ability to go outside your language, outside your culture, outside your tradition, outside your geographic area, and develop a relationship and develop a trust, which is so important to success. And that's what we try to build the CES on when we build it. That's what we try to do with the things we do in Washington, D.C., and, and in Canada, and other uh, countries' capitals and state capitals. So we try to create an environment where innovation can occur, occur where it will flourish, where there's not barriers to new entrants. Because the tendency in, in any society is for those that are doing very well to try to preserve their strength, including the largest companies in the world. And those that are, um, and yet there's, there's smart, smaller entrepreneurs and innovators, which need to, to be able to get their way in there. And one of the things I value about um, our system in the United States and other democratic systems is that we often uh, use our constitution and our federal laws to actually protect the new ones that come in because the old 
established guard, has the, the relationships, they have the trust with the policymakers. And they could almost agree with each other that they'll have new policies, which basically don't allow new entrants. They don't allow new innovations to occur. And we're seeing that a little bit now in the tech industry. Well, if you think about this, the uh, reputation of the technology companies, a few big ones, it's not very healthy in a way, but really they've been up against other industries like broadcast and cable, satellite, and content creators. Or if you could look at taxi cab drivers with Uber and Lyft and, um, uh, or hotel operators with Airbnb or VRBO. So all those companies, I will confess, are members of mine, all the ones that are the tech innovators. And what they're up against is an old established guard of companies that have um, relationships and, and political power and even politicians that are always supporting them and protecting the status quo. Because we're human beings. And the most natural thing to do as a human being is to protect the status quo, to think that everything will be always as it is and it's always as it should be. But yet the reality is, as we all know, is it whether it's in our personal life or our professional life, is that we all go through cycles, uh, businesses, even, and they, they, they start, they grow, and they, and they mature, and often they die if they don't innovate or change. And what we've seen in the last year is the importance of flexibility. And as I call it in a couple of my books, uh, based on the ninja theme, being a ninja, adapting to a new situation, you train, you prepare, but when you hit that battlefield, everything changes. And it goes to the way you hire, to the way you deal with things. We had our own ninja experience. Here we are, we produced the largest physical event in the world for business, and we had to literally shift and go to a pure digital event. And I think any event organizer knows how difficult that is to maintain that interactivity, to maintain your own brand, your image, your reputation for putting people together and providing novel speakers and ideas and concepts and technology. And, and we did it. You know, I spent, instead of being spending the week in Las Vegas uh, in January at CES, I spent it at Microsoft headquarters in Redmond, Washington, which was the platform we used Microsoft Teams, uh, as well as their cloud and other things to try to produce an event that was worthy of the innovation. And it did produce a lot, but it was so difficult for us, frankly, to take a skilled staff in one area and shift them in a matter of weeks, if not months, to another area. Uh, and it, it's, it's something that almost every business around the world has had to go through in one form or another this past year, and some have succeeded and some haven't. But you always have to be prepared to, to fail fast, to move fast, to switch, to change, and to behave differently, because there's always some other innovator that's going to come along and disrupt your disruption. We saw how, for example, the cable industry disrupted and, and satellite disrupted the broadcast industry, and then the Internet disrupted all of them. And now streaming platforms are disrupting some of the old internet players. There's always something that's going to come along. And the question is whether consumers will adapt and respond and want that product. And that requires a, a closeness and, a, and an openness to new ideas and the ability to shift. And we've seen that greatly, for example, with Netflix and with Amazon. We've seen companies that just totally shifted their business model, created their own destructive tools to create something new that will so that's, I, I don't want to take more time than no. I've given, so I'm going to pass along. Yeah, I think, no, that's a very holistic approach to self-development, team development, business, culture. Uh, it's definitely a great innovative mindset. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts, and we'll pick up some of those points later. Our next speaker is Faim Naim. Faim joins us from Miami. He is the CEO and founder of Ish Opportunity, a leading e-commerce Amazon growth consulting firm, which helps brands better understand and manage their online business. He is a leader in this field and has helped hundreds of brands drive engagement on Amazon. Prior to starting his own business, he was a category manager at Amazon where he owned and managed one of the largest categories in the US amounting to hundreds of millions of dollars. During his tenor, he was able to grow his business more than 50%, despite relatively a flat market. Fine, floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks, Gary, for, for all those uh, thoughts. Um, <clears throat> for me, so I think leadership can mean a lot to everyone, as you can imagine. Um, usually, if you Google it, which I'm sure some of us did right before to see um, people's thoughts. It's a lot of talking about leading with integrity and having a shared vision and enabling team members. But I was thinking about what it means to me. Um, and I think it's mostly about the difficult choices that you make. And it's those what I call sink or swim moments for the company. Um, leadership is easy when things are going well. When the business is moving in the right direction, we sometimes take that as um, 
uh, as confidence in ourselves and our own abilities. But it's um, when you have a, a true challenge and there was no shortage of challenges over the last year across the entire globe is when I think it really comes um, into test. So, for example, even pre-COVID for us, so our business is we work with large clients or, or emerging startups and we help them um, launch an e-commerce strategy and manage their business on Amazon and, and whatnot. Um, <clears throat> what happens when you lose a big client? And this is something I am a type A person like many other people who wears my emotions on my sleeves. And I sometimes will get very excited if we lose a big client or we miss out on a pitch or anything else negative happens. We lose an employee to another company. And I started to notice as we started scaling our team that um, people notice your attitude as a leader. They notice what you say. They notice your energy. They notice the way you react to those moments. And even if you are absolutely pissed about what just happened or you're taken back, um, you can you can show that you are um, passionate about it. But I think you're you have to be very um, tactful and thoughtful, maybe, on how you respond to that. Because um, when you're not on the phone uh, and you're not talking to the team, they take that as a direction on how they should act. So you lose a big client and. You're, you're cussing left and right and you're really angry. That's not going to motivate the team member to, to want to work harder. They're, they're going to blame it on the client rather than taking responsibility, et cetera, versus collectively taking that as a, a learning moment. Um, and I think I had to learn that over time because um, like many others, I, I grew up in Fortune 500 corporate environment where it was mostly about in individual contributions in your early, early on in your career. And as I started my own company, uh, kind of your skill set has to change very rapidly because it's, it's a lot less just about your individual contribution. But what can you do to scale the team? Um, let's talk about COVID for a second. Um, as as uh, e-commerce ended up doing okay, uh, let's say, uh, during COVID when it was all said and done, but nobody knew this. And again, Gary, you probably know some of this inside and out from your experience. Um, we had client spas about a year ago um, saying that our fulfillment centers were shut down because of COVID. Um, we are laser focused on Amazon and Amazon France was actually having a bunch of issues and they almost shut down the platform and they weren't doing fulfillment for non-priority goods. Um, etc. So there's a lot of um, um, anticipation or hesitation on what's going to happen or apprehension, probably a better way to put it. We, our sales all of a sudden went down about 25 to 30 percent in a couple months because of um, some of our largest clients had to pause because of the disruption. Um, we lost a couple of employees. We had to go remote at the same time. Uh, we went from an in-person environment to go to remote. We also had an employee that lost multiple family members to COVID at a party that she attended. Uh, and you got all these different things you're competing about. And um, as the CEO, you're focused on my top line and my bottom line. And what can I do to steer the course and make sure this company is continuing to scale? Um, but like moments like that to me are very, very valuable and um, are a much bigger test on leadership than kind of business continues to grow 50 percent year over year before before that. That's easy. Like uh, you're just you're just following a script. Um, and I don't claim to be an expert in it. And I think we, I, I handle, there's a number of things that I wish I handled better. At the end of the day, I think um, making sure that the team was engaged and um, we had two-way communication and we had a platform for people to voice their concerns and we had a platform for people to provide suggestions and talk through opportunities on how we can um, steer the ship. It all worked out. Um, our business ended up doubling in the back half of last year. And lots, a big part of that's probably e-commerce, less my leadership. Uh, in general, and then um, we're fortunate enough that uh, we just got acquired about a month ago, um, even though we thought that was going to be off the table given the current environment and everything that just happened. So I think for me, it was a great um, um, personal lesson on um, you're, you're not really measured as a person or as a leader until you've had the hardest point in your career and you had to make those difficult decisions. Um, and I'll end with this was at a very small scale. If you look at Airbnb, for example, a great case study that I'm sure there's going to be a ton of HBR um, uh, case uh, studies about in the future. They, about a year ago at this time, Brian Chesky had to lay out a large number um, of people on, on the team. They talked about the, the, the ongoing changes to the travel industry and how, how big of an impact that, um, that had to have. Yet they've done a reasonable uh, job uh, in, in many cases better than uh, expected on rebounding from that because uh, of the way they handled that. It could have been very easy to say things 
things are horrible right now. Sales are down 30, 40%. We have to lay people off. I'm sorry about it. And hands up, not, not, nothing I can do about it. But I think they, they did a great job on communicating why, trying to make sure that employees were taken care of, making sure that the employees that stayed um, were also motivated to try to um, uh, right the ship together. Um, and again, uh, the brighter days are ahead of them um, uh, based off of a number of things that they, they've done to become more flexible. So I think there's no shortage of good case studies that are out there right now on how to responsibly lead a company um, when you're in those toughest moments that there's almost no right answer and you're expected to make a very difficult decision with limited data and you wish you had more time to do it, but you have to take in all, all, all the um, information and make the best decision possible for your team and be accountable for it. Thank you very much, Faim. I think as I was listening to you, I believe in uh, self-realization that what we appreciate, appreciates. And I think you build a mutually respectful culture to grow together. And that, that that's great to hear. Um, thank you for sharing that. And our next speaker is Manuela Andaloro. Manuela joins us from Zurich, Switzerland. Welcome. Manuela is professional with over 20 years of experience in strategic content, marketing, data analytics, business development, a University of Cambridge alumni. She has worked in Milan, London, and Zurich for firms such as UBS, Financial News, and Nielsen. Manuela has also held global regional roles in financial services involving project management, communication, and stakeholder engagement passionate about macroeconomics and social change. Manuela is professional speaker, published author, and editorial consultant to leading publications on the topics of finance, socioeconomic shifts, impact, digitalization, as well as diversity and gender equality. Manuela, floor is yours. Thank you, Metin, and thank you, everybody. It's, um, it's really a pleasure to be here today. As you said, today I'm a consultant to the um, public and private sector on narratives and strategies around macroeconomics, um, social change, and digital transformation. It's all trends that are shaping how we're doing businesses every day. I'm Italian. I currently live in Zurich and um, with my husband and, and young children. It's been a very interesting year, of course, for parents of young children. We all had to adapt. And on that note, I wanted to, um, you know, to quickly start with looking back at previous generations. If I think of the aftermath of the Second World War, my grandfather saw his country, Italy, transformed from a agriculture based economy, which was seriously affected by the world wars into one of the most advanced and industrialized nations in the world, the leading G7 country. And he went from losing two of his baby sisters to the Spanish flu to being able to vaccinate thoroughly his two daughters from birth. He went from his father's horses to owning two good cars. So that generation had a very important skill. They had learned to adapt to any life circumstance. It's called AQ, Adaptability Quotient, and our current generations are not scoring very high. So one reason for this, and this is a little bit of work I do, um, especially in recent years, can be found in the way information is shared, communicated and consumed. For example, I was working in London during the financial crisis of 2007 and 8. That was the heart of the European crisis at the time. The financial crisis didn't just have disastrous economic consequences. It also negatively impacted the public's trust in the financial world, in corporations and in governments, tarnishing their reputation. And also many think that this led to the strong winds of populism that we've seen in the past few years. So, you know, what went wrong and, and what is still going wrong in today's crisis? So what, what experts also think is that the ability that was most tragically and dramatically lost and lacking during the 2008 crisis and somewhat is still lacking today was the ability to communicate specifically you know industry and governments failed to communicate the nature of the problem what was at stake in terms of risks and so why in america alone it was necessary to spend 700 billion dollars of taxpayers money to solve the problem so in the light of digital transformation today 
current information and communication models must increasingly be adapted. And that's a bit what also everybody uh, referred to. Um, and we need to meet the growing needs of a public if we think citizens, but also professionals, politicians, academia, everybody, that we have access to ever increasing amounts of information. We just don't know how to digest it. Often we're exposed to fake news. And often we're not, we don't know everything, all of us in each, in each sector. So we often have little clarity and perspective on many issues. So in my view, trustworthy and responsible leadership, and we'll elaborate a little bit later, is tied to strategic communication and is vital for industry and for governments. Um, what leaders must do, and, and many do that successfully, it, 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 they must convey not just the goals and intentions and strategies to stakeholders and societies, but also educate the general public. So a responsible leader to me is an unbiased, as much as possible, thought leader and um, on certain topics and also must reduce or work to reduce fake news and speculation. Government and industry have a moral duty to me to, and, and to many increasingly to provide context and clarity by working together and keeping communication channels open with all stakeholders, with the media especially, which had a, played a very interesting role during the financial crisis in, uh, in uh, 2007 and 8, and with the media and all influencers, um, creating some sort of mutual trust because in the next 10 years, our democracies and the world at large have plenty at stake. So I do hope that in the next decade, if we set the bar right today, we will set um, and achieve crucial goals. Thank you very much. I, I fear, I sense the genuine interaction, transparency, authenticity in relationships and the openness in the culture, I think. And we need a lot of that. Um, I'm sorry not to see Morgan yet. I understand that he's trying to join and uh, I will just move on to our round two. And uh, we would like to reflect and realize that in our own individual journeys, we uh, grow with either realizing a value that we receive from somebody because they were really caring enough to mentor us, or we have added value to somebody else through our own mentorship. So Gary, could you just share your experience and your values? And I know this is a personal passion and expertise that you have. Let's talk a little bit about mentorship and see if we can grow together with that. Thank you for that. Uh, mentorship is something that definitely has played a role in my career. I was very fortunate to have many, many different mentors at different times. Uh, it was never formal except once, and I'll get to that in a second. Uh, it was just people who took an interest in what I was doing, and I took an interest in them. I didn't ever go up to someone as recently people have come up to me and asked, can you be my mentor? Not knowing me or getting to me on LinkedIn. And I always find that very awkward and strange. What I did have when I was starting out uh, after graduate school, it was uh, I was working at a law firm as a young lawyer and I was paired up with a partner. And the partner said to me, you know, we both don't like each other. I don't like you and I know you don't like me. So we'll just pretend to do this. And that was a disaster. So that was my experience with a formal mentor program. Having said that, we have a formal mentor program in my organization. Most employees participate. It's totally voluntary. They both have to agree that they want each other. And I've only heard great things about it. Uh, and some of our biggest stars have, have mentored the most people. Uh, I will say that in my uh, mentorship, it's uh, today I I try to pretty much stay away from my own employees and mentor them in any sort of formal way because I don't want to be viewed as favoring one employee's career over another. So I stay at it formally, but I do give a lot of independent advice. And I also have reached out to uh, many different people I know in different aspects of, of, of the businesses we're in and taken especially younger people, uh, many African-American, many women, and gone after them and formally offered my own opportunity to spend some time with them to help them and, and mentorship to me is, is not just advice. It's listening. It's learning. It's introductions. It's giving them, the, helping them get their first customer or their first speaking gig, the first consulting relationship or things like that. So I think it's an obligation that it almost occurs naturally. It's kind of like you want to get rid of stuff as you get older and declutter. As you get older and you reach a certain age, I think you want to just start helping more and more people. And that's what gives you joy. So my uh, that is my mentoring experience. It's something that I think is very important. 
I'm always sometimes surprised and honored when one of my employees will, will uh, credit me with mentoring them. I didn't realize I was doing it often at the time, um, but I'm very pleased and proud that, that so many have said that and, and so many have gone on to other things and stayed in touch and connected with that in the employee relationship, but I think it's important. I really want to get back to uh, what uh, Fahim said about teachable moment because I want to know the teachable moment he has when he loses a customer. I want to know what he actually learns and teaches. I just heard that was an important moment. Uh, is it, what do you, uh, how you uh, act and how you behave, obviously, as a CEO is, is watched by everyone. It's every new CEO, and I mentor a lot of new CEOs. It's something that they see and, it, and they, they model, and that is the biggest thing that I teach people that are rising executives. And I also, uh, in my, because of what I do, and I'm dealing with CEOs, of many different companies, I found that I am mentoring the CEOs because the CEOs themselves do not have anyone else to talk to. They can't talk to their customers. They can't talk to their employees. Uh, it's difficult for them to talk to their colleagues or often their competitors. So I find myself uh, speaking with them more about their, their careers, their challenges, their business challenges, how to address things, the likelihood that their board is not getting along with them then I uh, often spend time talking about our own company's business with them. So those are the various aspects of uh, mentorship that I wanted to share with you, many different Thank flavors. You. Oh, thanks very much. Uh, it's always great to have somebody that years later comes and says, you touched my life. And it was that idea that you gave me or something that's always touching. So Fahim, what's your experience? Uh, yeah, thanks for that. Um, I, I've, I, I think of mentorship um, has been traditionally recognized as a formal somebody who is older than you that's more senior that has some of the expertise that you seek out um and i've had my share of of, of people that I've, I've leaned on previously um but i think the interesting thing maybe just to talk about for this panel is um i've also progressed my my thought on what mentorship is it could be a friend it could be a family member it could be a peer and some of the um, people who I kind of, as I was thinking about this question, some of the people who I didn't even realize, I thought they were just really good friends that I asked for advice. They're probably my mentor more than some of the formal structures that I have sought off, uh, sought after previously. So, for example, one of my mentors is one of my best friends who exited his company for a hundred million dollars in two years, and I kept on thinking that it couldn't be done. And when I started off my own business and I had left um, working at Amazon, it was scary because Amazon stock kept on going up and kept on asking if that was the right um, decision and if I should go back um, and kind of just seeing his journey and just having a little bit of confidence. I'm like, Hey, you're, you can figure anything out if you want to, like if you want to do this and you want to pull your all in it, you can absolutely get it done. But if your, if your heart's on it, don't do it. And I think just those small moments that I didn't realize were, were mentorship I've really had a, a significant impact on myself and um, um, where I've been able to get to for now and hopefully where I'll be able to get to in the future. And then similarly on the mentee side, um, uh, outside of formal structures, um, I have often, since I've gone through the Fortune 500 to entrepreneur route, I've often sought after friends and family that feel like they're unhappy in a specific role and try to talk through it. And one of my cousins who is a, um, high performing, six figure salary lawyer working at a large law firm. You can tell he hated his job. And I had a number of conversations with him on why don't you do this on your own? Why don't you try something else? You have so many other passions. And it's so about a year of back and forth. And it was no way, like I have student loans and I have this and I have that. And long story short, he ended up following some of my advice that um, I tried not to sue him too hard uh, to, but he eventually. Um, quit his job, started his own law firm, started three other companies and has done very well for himself. And um, now when I look back, I, I, I wasn't trying to be a mentee. I, I viewed it just more as kind of friend to friend or family member to family member advice. And um, I think the more I think about that, that's probably very common um, that we don't realize that we are being a mentor or we are, we're being a mentor or we're a mentee. Um, on a very informal basis and in all those moments, they don't always have to be. It's great if there is a structural program to supplement it, but if there isn't, or if it doesn't seem like it's a good fit, there's, there's again, teachable moments. I think it's a great way to put it as Gary mentioned um, all the time. It's a, uh, it's an organic evolution uh, that I think then you just shape as moments uh, go with a, 
value add mindset. And I think you build your entrepreneurial business through mentoring around and you are still mentoring as a business. So thank you very much, Manila, your experience. And uh, also Morgan, welcome. I'm very, very pleased to see you. And I'll introduce you after Manila shares her experience on mentorship. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think um, so. Mentorship taught me um, both who I wanted to be and who I did not want to become. I had both example of successful, empathic mentors who were great leaders with high EQ and examples of, of arrogance. Um, because of so many years in the corporate world, I had a lot of, you know, formal mentors. Uh, but actually, as as you all also said, um, I've, great, I've, I've gained great value from private life mentors, unexpected mentors, uh, women and men who, show, who have shown so much uh, resilience and courage and strength. So as a mentor myself, I've tried to use um, honesty and transparency as a baseline to show empathy and you know, tailor my awareness and understanding of situations of the mentee uh, based on how they were experiencing them. So I think mentorship has transformed me uh, 20 years in, in the sense that it helped me to see clearly what type of leaders uh, de facto are able to have a positive impact on people, on society, and really a large on democracies, and those that were extremely damaging. And in this sense, I think it has shaped my understanding of the bigger picture and the importance of what we call soft skills. I, I truly believe that those are the skills that are at the foundation of our societies, our governments, businesses, and, and those will get us through the next 10 years. You know, the popular press focuses a lot on charisma as the mark of leadership, but actually history is full of charismatic leaders who attracted lots of followers and then led them in very manipulative ways. So that's not what I look up to. Thank you very, very much. Uh, a lot of experience there for sure. Um, I'm now pleased to introduce Morgan Parnis. Uh, Morgan joins us from Malta. He is CEO and managing partner at Business Leaders Limited, Malta, a company which several ventures, including the Academy of Business Leaders, which focuses on higher education and Esprimi, a research company in Malta specializing in market, employee, and media research solutions. Morgan is also the chairperson of Lobes Lab, a company that focuses on business intelligence software development solutions. As can be seen, Morgan brings together multiple standards uh, or strands of research and professionalism to focus on his engines on creating vision, defining impactful strategies, and driving growth. Morgan, because of a late join, please, in a, if you can just share your evolution, um, uh, your experiences, and how you feel that trust that leadership can be built uh, from your own experience uh, in a few minutes, and then we will just go to the questions section. Thanks sure. very much. Thank you, and apologies for being late. Um, so from a trust issue point of view, uh, very often we work hand-in-hand hand with uh, company CEOs from our research point of view in making sure that the, the values that they embrace and that they practice within the business are in actual fact um, understood and uh, also um, um, practiced by, by their fellow employees. We, in fact, run a trust barometer, both in terms of um, uh, company indexes in Malta, but we also run a trust barometer for our politicians because that is something that is pretty much key because ultimately, uh, very often, we look up to the institutions that are managing the, uh, our countries and these are things that we run on a regular basis. And it's also linked hand in hand with the HR practices of most of the employers we work with, because these are um, uh, issues that one can track, can review, and can um, use in PR settings to make sure that uh, people trust their leaders. So in extent, this is something that we regularly run as an institution, which is also then practiced in our higher education business, where we are training people from diplomas in leadership and management to master's degrees. And this is one of the key areas that we support in their development, uh, including other coaching, which is done by, uh, it, I just joined in and I was listening to what was happening, which is also something very popular in supporting CEOs in many of the organizations in Malta. Thank you very much. 
Um, considering that we have about six minutes, I will just uh, skip to the questions and answers. We have a number of questions. Uh, Gary, by being close to governments, large institutions, entrepreneurs, and wealth of other members, driving thought leadership, can you share an example of relationships with public and private organizations that have benefited from building a values-based culture in which appreciating passion and trust played a significant role to drive innovation and market leadership. Try to answer it in about a minute, please. Uh, a great example of that is the development of the high definition television uh, standard in uh, the United States. Uh, we decided early on what our goal was. Uh, government and industry got together and many different aspects of industry from TV set makers to broadcasters to cable providers, satellite providers, retailers, consumer groups, and others. Uh, with government officials. And we said, here's our big goal. Our big goal is to have a great system. We came up with definitions on it. We came up with technical ways of getting there. We had a, we created a model, uh, a, a center where we tested things. And it was a cooperative effort with a big goal in mind. And I think it, it, we started the right way early. It was chaired by a former chairman of the Federal Communications Commission who really was very good at getting everyone the consensus. And when it came time to 24 different approaches to the solution, they fell out one by one in the testing process. They ended up with five and they created the five, created a grand alliance, which is now the standard in the U.S. and many other countries. And it works really well. People love HDTV. Uh, other regions of the world made some big mistakes. They had to recall things. They had to go. They wanted to stay with analog, but we went to the best possible thing. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Time, your extensive work in e-commerce, digital transformation, and management has seen you develop teams and manage consumer trust. How do you approach the challenge of building consumer trust and loyalty through leadership in transforming world? How do you see the role of entrepreneurs as leaders in the new digital market paradigm? Um, I think e-commerce has, uh, has a different rule, what I call different rules of engagement than traditional commerce and, and, and being in stores. And it's helped move things from a one way conversation, brand telling customer what they need, what they think they need to know. And that's it to a two way conversation and obviously reviews and question and answer and the ability to message sellers and, and get answers or talk to other buyers has changed the paradigm on, on how you communicate. I think um, the, the lesson is more increased transparency, the more you're authentic, the more you acknowledge um, customer issues, the better off you are. Don't hide behind the fact that your product has a monthly pl subscription plan. Mention it up front because the customer is going to be pissed when they buy it and they don't know about that. And even though it feels counterintuitive, telling people that they invest more up front, if you don't say that, you're going to lose their trust. I think um, at least in e-commerce, it's more about being transparent and understanding that it is a two-way conversation. And the second part of the question, the role of entrepreneurs um, in the digital marketing paradigm, it, they're hungry, they're looking for ways to innovate, they're constantly A-B testing, and they're doing lots of things that um, larger companies are not able to do. You, you have a $5 billion business, you're not going to be able to pivot as quickly as an entrepreneur who's going to be A-B testing titles and bullets and images on a daily basis. So I think it also keeps larger companies um, uh, at bay and, and on their toes, so to speak, to make sure that they're adapting where they're possible. In many of those cases, you're not able to adapt. And um, a 25-year-old is going to come up with a different way to market um, hand soap than, than uh, P&G has ever done it. And they're going to do a great job about it. And that's the, the new world that we live in. This is the new era for all of us. Manuela, having worked with clients who have benefited from your strategic advice, vision, value, and voice, what is your experience of leadership in top organizations? As a follow-up, what is your driving value proposition to help organizations transform their leadership to a trustworthy and responsible manner, for example, such as financial services? One yeah. minute, please. <laughs> Thank One you. Minute. Okay, I'll be very quick. So my key impact on organizations is helping them, you know, in a, in a, in a very simple way, uh, build trust as social capital. 
because the social, economic and environmental challenges of this decade require new approaches to leadership and responsibility. So I support them in framing this need and creating the narrative and engagement and support this with ad hoc strategies to target segments, to engage with all of their customers in a way and to speak to them in a way they, they will understand. And within organizations, so some argue that those in authority positions in, a, in a, an organization pyramid are the leaders of the organization, but this is really changing. So this conception had worked in the past, uh, but works less and less. And so we're seeing the decline of authority and the, the rise of trust as an organization principle. To be effective today, um, in my experience, strategic leaders need to combine trust, it's not enough, with competence and emotional intelligence, emotional quotient. If we look at the uh, definition given to trust by the OECD, that's a person's belief that another person or institution will act consistently with their expectations of positive behavior. So trust matters for the well-being of people, but also of the country where they live. And there is very strong evidence of, of its role in supporting social and economic relations. So this is what I help organizations and governments increasingly to. Um, with so that the trust uh, leads to economic growth and we've seen that trust and uh, i think it's, it's an underlying foundation for everything thank you very much uh, morgan very quickly when empowering future business leaders who have the potential to influence institutions how do you em emphasize the importance of embedding the values of building responsible leadership and trust into their business how can you ensure that these are maintained as businesses that for growth. Okay, so, um, very simply, one who has to practice what they preach. Uh, we often are uh, supporting through the communications arm um, the uh, HR team in running focus groups internally to make sure that the organization is aligned with the with the values, which are not just on a website for the sake of being there, but that they are being really implemented absorbed and um, adapting to the needs of the organization, particularly when you're working with SMEs, this tends to be much easier because it's a small team where possibly people are within a small structure and can live this day to day. But as soon as this changes from an SME to a much larger organization, things tend to be much easier to get diluted. And this is where training and, uh, and support needs to be implemented to make sure that everyone is aligned um, pointing north. Thank you very, very much. Uh, we will now conclude our panel discussion. I would like to first thank Dr. Frank and to each and every one of the panelists for their incredible contribution on the important topic today. To you all our audience and friends of Horasis, and I wish you health, safety in these uncertain, volatile times. I hope you have all gained as much out of this panel as I have. And lastly, one of the most important things that we would like to leave the audience with one recommendation of a book that really you would like to just give a name that everybody can benefit from, please. One, just go around from Gary Feynman. The uh, Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. You should live in the moment and pay attention to the people that are around you rather than thinking about the past or worrying about the future. Amazing. Thank you. The Hard Thing About Hard Things by Ben Horowitz. Great book. that talks about the ups and downs of leading a company and those, those sink or swim moments that I love to talk about. Thank you. Quiet. My recommendation is called Quiet, The Power of Introverts by Susan Cain. Um, this book raises awareness on how modern Western culture totally misunderstands and undervalues the traits of introverted people. And actually, she shows how top leaders of the past and of the present were actually introverted. So she urges changes at the workplace, in schools, and in parenting too. Amazing. Morgan? <laughs> Either Leaders Eat Lust by Simon Sinek. It's a Excellent. fantastic book. Um, yeah, I, I love these book sessions because we will all go and read. We just have, we are just growing already faster. Uh, one outlook from me, let's grow together mentor to mentor, peer to peer, deal to deal, and reach out many to many together with an enriching purpose. And one book from me, it's called I Leadership Strategies of Seeing, Being, Doing by Professor Nigel Nicholson. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Enjoy your rest of the uh, sessions, uh, many beautiful panels, and I uh, look forward to seeing you in person soon. Thank you. Thank you. All the best. Thanks, Martin. Bye.